with us today, Maxime Sermesant. Maxime received his MSc from Ecole Normale Supérieure de Cachan and his PhD in Control Signal and Images Processing from the University of Nice. From 2003 and 2005, uh, was a research fellow at, with the Cardiac MR Research Group at King College London. And since 2005, he's a research scientist at INRIA. Here is a research work combines biophysical, computational, and statistical modeling with clinical data. And this is possible owing to a multidisciplinary work, uh, which is at the intersection uh, of academic, clinical, and industrial environment. And in particular, his main focus uh, are the application of patient-specific models of the heart to cardiac pathologies. He was uh, involved in the PI of several previous projects, for example, just to mention one, the virtual physiological human. Today, the talk of uh, Maxime Sarmezan is about artificial intelligence and cardiac biophysics, uh, learning by art, Please, Maxime, you can start and we can have a discussion and when you will finish. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to present uh, this. So I think that uh, I'll first go through some of the personalized modeling work we've been doing over the last uh, 15 uh, years. And uh, we focused mostly on two main uh, cardiac pathologies, which are cardiac arrhythmias, because ventricular arrhythmia, as you may know, has a huge impact on uh, mortality. And atrial fibrillation is present in many, many people with also uh, important impact, in particular on strokes. And uh, heart failure, which is a, a major cause of uh, hospitalization and with a very bad uh, prognosis. So I don't think I need to motivate much uh, cardiac modeling uh, to this audience. I mean, you know well all the kind of uh, physical phenomena that uh, are involved in cardiac function and all the kind of models and mathematical models you can uh, set up for these phenomena. What uh, we've been focusing on is mostly the personalization. So how do you go from these uh, generic models to the patient-specific model? Because by extracting uh, parameters from this patient data, you can help in uh, characterizing the disease, therefore help in diagnosis but you can also test some therapy on this personalized uh, model and try to see how the patient would respond to this therapy or how to optimize therapy planning. So I'll start the, the first step is to build up an anatomical model of the heart. And uh, one challenge is the cardiac fibers. You, you probably know the cardiac structure, which is very complex with these spirals, which are imbricated. And it's very difficult to get patient-specific fiber architecture. So we had this project uh, with King's College London where it started to be possible to acquire a few slices, so two-dimensional slices of the heart in vivo on a beating heart using MRI and uh, measuring the diffusion of water molecules locally in every pixel of these images. So we could reconstruct the tensors, the diffusion tensors, for each pixel of these images. And it has been shown that these diffusion tensors are very well correlated with the local fiber orientation. But for 3D modeling, having just few uh, slices in that is not enough. So we proposed a way to, to do some interpolation between these slices, uh, shape-based interpolation, because the heart, the left ventricle has this very particular ellipsoidal uh, shape. So by using a prolate spheroidal coordinates and uh, by adjusting the patient heart to these coordinates, we could reformulate the problem of this uh, extrapolation to an interpolation uh, in, a, in a set of coordinates where the interpolation gives a much more natural uh, evolution of the, of the fiber. So we could learn the interpolation kernels on, on some data sets and then uh, extrapolate uh, and interpolate the, the slices. So by doing this, we could compute some statistics on uh, in vivo hearts. So the, the advantage is that the MR sequence we were using could also measure uh, two cardiac phases. So we measured the uh, fiber orientations both at diastole, so when the heart is relaxed, and in systole when the heart is contracted. And uh, actually, the, when you look at the fiber orientation statistics, it's not that different. Uh, because as the heart is contracting in uh, several directions at the same, uh, in the same way, then it makes the directions kind of stable uh, along the contraction. 
So having these 3D uh, tensor fields uh, interpolated enables to do some fiber tracking. So we could track uh, the fibers uh, for diastole and uh, systole. And you can see these uh, imbricated spirals, I mean, the blue and red spirals with this uh, angle varying when you go through the wall. So it was uh, quite nice to start to be able to measure this on a beating heart and not just on ex vivo hearts. And by studying the other eigenvectors of the diffusion tensor, we also try to look at the laminar structure because you, you may know that the fibers are not just one direction, but they're organized by laminar sheets. So we try to look if diffusion tensor enables to, to track these sheets as well and reconstruct them. And uh, so it's more noisier because that's not the largest eigenvalue. I mean, that's, uh, you have to look at the other eigenvalues. But still, uh, it was quite uh, interesting. And you can see that even if the fibers in themselves are quite stable uh, along contraction, this laminar structure is much more impacted by contraction, quite naturally. So this is the, the first step to build a personalized model. So you need a personalized shape and fibers. And then uh, you need to simulate the propagation of uh, cardiac electrophysiology. So our uh, use case is uh, ventricular arrhythmia, because this is uh, one of the major causes of ventricular fibrillation, which can create sudden cardiac arrest if there's no intervention in a few minutes. So there's been luckily some uh, interventions available, like cardiac catheter ablation, where you have to go into the heart and uh, you, you burn the, the cells which are responsible for this arrhythmia. However, it's still not uh, completely uh, generalized how to, what is the optimal strategy, which part should you burn. I mean, therefore, there is still a large recurrence rate. So almost half of the patients have to come back a, a second time. And the procedures are, are very long. So the idea is, can we build a patient-specific model so that we really can test different strategies and then beforehand, before the intervention, uh, plan the, the therapy. So for this work, we used the Mitchell Schaeffer uh, model, which is uh, one of the simplest uh, reaction diffusion models of cardiac uh, electrophysiology. It has only two variables. And uh, so for personalization, that's really a, a big advantage. because It has not too many variables and not too many parameters. So there is a hope to be able to observe these parameters and fit them to data. And the other advantage uh, of this model is that you have a, an analytical formula for the restitution curve that you can see on the, on the bottom right, which is the, how the heart electrophysiology adapts to changing in a heart rhythm. So if the heart starts to beat faster, then the action potential duration will get shorter. And the way this, the heart adapts to change in cardiac rhythms is quite important in the development of uh, arrhythmia. So this is a, an, an element of the model that we want to personalize also. And having an analytical formula for this curve based on the model parameters is very useful in order to, to do this kind of personalization. So by estimating the conduction velocity and the restitution properties, we could personalize this model. So the data we used was very expensive, extensive and very invasive. So it was a a cohort at King's College London where there was a complete mapping of the heart with a non-contact uh, mapping system. So the inside system, which is a balloon of electrodes within the heart. And the advantage of this non-contact mapping system is that then you can map every heartbeat. I mean, you don't have to move around the catheter. I mean, you just measure every heartbeat. So we could measure a whole pacing procedure. So when the cardiologists start pacing the heart faster and faster to see if they're gonna start an arrhythmia. That's to evaluate the risk of arrhythmia and where to ablate, where to do the ablation. So we had recordings with a full cardiac electrophysiology study and also images of these hearts with uh, infarct localization from MRI. So by using a contrast uh, agent, so gadolinium, we can produce an image of the heart where the, the infarct is very bright, as you can see in, the, in this uh, white square on top. Then you need to fuse also the information from the catheters and the information from, uh, from the images. So there was a lot of work uh, at King's College London to work on this registration and fusion. Nowadays, it gets uh, easier and easier with the catheter localization systems, but uh, it's still a challenge to fuse all the data in the same spatial and temporal uh, coordinates. 
So having this data, we could estimate the diffusion part or the conduction velocity of the, of the model. And having a paste bits at different uh, frequencies, we could also estimate these restitution properties. So how does the heart action potential duration adapt to changing in pacing frequencies? And as I said, so we had a, re a full recording for the whole study. So when the heart of this patient did go into ventricular arrhythmia, we had a mapping of, the, of this arrhythmia from the endocardium. And on the bottom right, you can see a video of the virtually induced arrhythmia. So we adjusted the parameters on few paced bits, and then we paced the model faster and faster, and it also induced an arrhythmia. So the question was, uh, do we produce an arrhythmia which is uh, predictive of what happened in, in this patient? And you can see here on the left, so that's a bullseye plot. So that's a way to flatten the heart. I mean, if you look at it from the bottom, from the apex, but you see the whole left ventricle in, in 2D. And that's an activation map. So what is in red is what is called the exit point. So where the circuit starts. So arrhythmias are a circuit, a loop, which is uh, creating this tree entry. So often uh, cardiolog cardiologists want to go and burn the exit point, so this red part, so that the circuit cannot propagate anymore. And as you can see on the bullseye plot of the model prediction, I mean, we, we also had this kind of uh, exit point. Uh, the red areas are quite well correlated with the one which were measured. And in addition, it's not just a mapping of the endocardium as the catheter, because it's a full 3D simulation in the full myocardium. So we can look at the activation in the volume and also at the whole circuit, because some of these arrhythmias you, you measure from the endocardium, but actually the best place where you should burn is on the epicardium. So it's a full different, fully different uh, approach for the cardiologist. So having this kind of prediction of the circuits beforehand can also change the way the intervention is done. And so we had two patients uh, in this cohort and for these two patients, we, we did predict the exit point of the circuit uh, with quite an uh, interesting uh, precision. Uh, interestingly enough, on the second patient, we predicted a circuit, but which was rotating in the other way. But uh, I mean, as cardiologists also say, I mean, that's something which happens. And actually, the, yeah, there's a kind of symmetry on, on this kind of propagation. So you can have a, a given loop which propagates in one way or the other in the same heart. So once uh, you have this kind of personalized extrophysiology, then you can add the mechanical uh, aspect to so the cardiac contraction. So this is what we looked at for heart failure and the uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. So as I said, heart failure is a very big uh, burden also on uh, world health. But uh, some decades ago, I mean, cardiac resynchronization therapy was proposed and revolutionized the treatment of heart failure. So the idea is to put different pacing leads in different places of the heart so that the contraction is more synchronous because these hearts with heart failure often are asynchronous. So some parts of the heart contract while other parts are relaxed. So it's not very efficient in, in creating pressure. So by putting these pacing leads, then you can have a more homogeneous contraction and much better pressure increase. But it's a very complex uh, therapy because you have to know where to put, put the leads what is the timing of the delays between the different leads to be optimal? And who are the patients who will really respond to the therapy or not? Because there's still one third of the patients who get this pacing device implanted and still don't benefit from it. And they don't respond to the therapy because their heart, the way it's paced, and it's not efficient. So the same, we had very invasive and extensive data. So with imaging and electrical mapping of patients. So from the dynamic uh, MRI images, we could adjust some contractility and stiffness parameters. And from the electrical mapping, we could adjust this uh, electrical propagation that you can see on the mesh. So we personalized on the, on the baseline data so that the heart uh, with heart failure and with this asynchronous way of contracting, if you look at the septum, for instance, it moves before uh, the other part of the heart. And the idea was then if we personalize the parameters on this uh, sick heart, and then we stimulate the heart in other places, how predictive is it of the changes in the contraction of the heart? So we put virtual pacing electrodes in uh, different locations that you can see on this uh, figure. 
and simulated the, the heartbeat with the same parameters, the mechanical parameters we had estimated on the, on the sick uh, situation. And we could see that we had a good uh, predictive value. So this is the fitting of the curve when we do the personalization. So in red, that the measure the pressure and in dashed that the simulated pressure. So it's the time derivative of the pressure. So it's to show how much the upstroke of the pressure is important. That's what you want to improve with this kind of therapy when you have synchronous contraction. And then without changing any model parameters, just the initial condition of the electrical uh, model, we could have a good prediction of the changes in this upstroke. So this patient would well respond to therapy because his pressure would increase uh, much faster during a contraction. And with a good correlation between the data in red again and the simulation in dash to blue. And uh, finally, on, on the mechanical uh, model, I mean, it's still a, a challenge. I mean, uh, for those of you who work on cardiac mechanics, it's still a, an important challenge to simulate uh, the heart. So we are looking into ways to, to simplify uh, also the, the cardiac mechanics. I mean, for the electrophysiology, there is the iconal model, which is a very fast and simple way to simulate uh, spatial propagation of the front. So we would like to find also some simplified models of the of the mechanics. And something we proposed uh, recently was to change completely the way we define the degrees of freedom of, uh, of these models. Because working on cardiac images, we could observe that uh, if you just allow one affine transformation per region of the heart, so here you can divide the heart in 17 uh, regions for the left ventricle, and that's what uh, clinicians do uh, classically. In the end, uh, just one affine transformation per segment, per region, is enough to reproduce well the cardiac motion. So we actually define a, a motion tracking algorithm based on this kind of polyaffine method, and we can have a good accuracy. Which means that probably uh, having a, a set of, uh, of affine transformations may be enough as degrees of freedom to represent well cardiac motion. We don't need a displacement per point of the mesh. So we work on reformulating uh, the model and. Uh, how we solve it by having as degrees of freedom uh, these uh, affine transform. The other advantage is that clinically, uh, clinicians are very interested by strain. I mean, that's what they want to measure in uh, the cardiac wall, this deformation. And if you work with affine transform, uh, you directly parameterize more or less your, your model with strain. Uh, so it's, uh, it means that you are directly comparable with uh, the kind of data clinicians want to look at. And finally, it's also a meshless approach. So the, the meshing uh, part, which is also very challenging in, in cardiac geometries, uh, can also be alleviated on this. But I mean, we started on this uh, last year. So we just have very uh, preliminary results on simple geometries. But uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, way to, to look at things. But uh, I mean, I showed you. Um, results and nice videos, but it's still uh, just two cases uh, on electrophysiology and two cases on uh, cardiac mechanics. So I don't think that's enough to convince uh, clinicians to change the way they do their practice. So there are still many limitations how to do this in a, on a large scale. Uh, one of them is the realism of the models. I mean, we still, uh, we're still uh, sometimes wondering, are we using the right equations? Are we using the right model? the patient selection also, which are the right patients that we need to model. And maybe some patients which shouldn't go for biophysical models. We have other ways to decide of the best way to, to treat them. We still rely on very invasive measurements in these examples I showed you. I mean, we had electrical mapping, a uh, lot of imaging. The processing time frame is also still uh, often uh, quite heavy, especially when you start talking about personalization. It means that you need to run an optimization uh, process so it can be very lengthy. Also, uh, I mean, how, I, how do you ensure that you cover the viability of uh, all the kind of pathologies and patients that you're gonna have to, to process? And uh, we are often working on uh, deterministic models and um, there's a need for uncertainty quantification in, uh, in this kind of clinical application. So how do you introduce this in, uh, in these methods which, without having a exploding uh, computational time? So that's where maybe, um, what comes from what is called now artificial intelligence or machine learning or more like group-wise and statistical approaches, uh, maybe can help in, uh, in solving some of these limitations. And uh, I think uh, what's interesting is that these are very two complementary ways at looking at, at the patients because 
if you look at this biophysical model, you, you start often from the model of the cell, from the question at the cellular level, and then you aggregate them in space to have a model of tissue and then of the organ and potentially of the system. And you go up to the patient and you have lots of different phenomena, physical phenomena to model. While more of the statistical approaches are starting from a group or either species or populations and compute statistics on uh, various features, which can be on shape and deformation. And then you can compare statistically a given patient to these group-wise statistics. It also provides you information on this patient. So these are really two kind of orthogonal ways to, to look at the patient. But they can really complement each other because if you look, for instance, how uh, AI can help the biophysical modeling, often in modeling, there are many, many uh, phenomena to model. And it's not always easy to know which are the most relevant ones. So having this kind of uh, statistical approaches can extract which are, are the phenomena the most important to input in the model and which are the ones that we can approximate. Also, it can help in a model reduction and in uncertainty quantification, I mean, to reformulate things in a more statistical manner. And on the other hand, I mean, whatever AI or machine learning or statistical approach would uh, tell you, it just, uh, correlations, but not really causality. So you don't know what are the mechanisms underlying what you find in the data. So of course, biophysical models are very nice for this, to propose mechanisms or to test the hypothesis. And also in this kind of learning approaches, you need often a big databases. And we know that labeled databases are a big challenge in healthcare. So a biophysical model can be a way to generate a database which has inherently all the labels you want because you directly control the, the generation process. And also I think it's a nice way to, to formulate physiology and to formulate uh, what we know about human anatomy and function. So maybe that's a way also to mathematically uh, introduce uh, some constraints and some priors in uh, AI approaches. So I'll now show you some examples of how we try to couple these kind of uh, approaches. One which I call more biophysics for AI, so how uh, modeling can help some AI approaches, and then AI for biophysics, which is how uh, AI can reformulate things or provide a, a different approach for things that we classically do with uh, modeling. So first, um, as I said, uh, Modeling is very interesting to do uh, data generation or data augmentation. And uh, the idea was at some point we wanted to estimate the electrical activity of the heart from motion. So if you have a, a beating heart, can you predict what is the electrical activation which generated this, uh, this heartbeat? But it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, quite complex to acquire data where you have both the electrical mapping and the motion and everything uh, co-registered. And here, if we want to simulate this from uh, the model, there is the, the step of simulating the, the medical image, which is also very complex. I mean, the whole physical process of image acquisition is uh, very difficult. So what we propose is rather than generate a, a full image, we can start from a, an image that's a, a beating heart in ultrasound. And then we have uh, our model, which is a beating heart. And then we can replace the motion in this uh, ultrasound sequence by the motion from our model. So basically we freeze this image sequence by uh, estimating the motion from the original image. And then we replace this motion by the one from the model. So we uh, tested this on a database of uh, patients with uh, MRI. So on this video, you can see on top that's the the model in green and the image underlying. And you can see that the, in particular at the septum, it's not fitting. And once we impose the model motion on the, the image, you can see that the septum is moving uh, the same way that the model uh, wants it to move. So we had this process to generate uh, synthetic images where we have also the whole electrical activation because we have it in the, in the model we use. And then we use some uh, machine learning. So here it was uh, support vector machines only in our way to estimate the, the links between the, all the deformation and displacement features we could observe and the electrical activity of the heart. And by training uh, this, we could estimate uh, an activation pattern from a motion uh, pattern, basically. So, I mean, there's still lots of things to improve. And here at that time, we had to generate a full database per patient because it was specific to the anatomy of this patient. 
but it's to show the I mean the idea that uh, there are many cases where it's very hard or even impossible to to measure the data which would be necessary to to do uh, learning, and in these cases, uh, modeling can be a very good, uh, interesting way to to generate this data. But then, as I said, here we had to do everything on one uh, per patient. We had to generate database and. Uh, it's uh, one of the, also the challenges of these learning approaches is that sometimes when you move to another patient or to another uh, hospital, I mean, the data will be a bit different and then the algorithm may fail completely. So there is this uh, transfer learning approach, which is a way to, to transfer what you've learned on a specific database to another database. And we, we looked at this in the context of uh, ECGI, so electrocardiographic imaging. Because we, we proposed a model-based way to, to solve this problem. So the idea is uh, from the electrical recording on the torso, are you able to predict the electrical activity in the heart? So in our case, again, with the Mitchell Schaeffer model, uh, we simulate a, a large database to learn the link between uh, the signals on the torso and the cardiac activation. And then from this learning, we could estimate for a new recording of torso uh, measurement what is the most probable uh, activation map uh, on the heart. And in this case, it was patients with, who had already a pacing uh, device implanted. So we knew exactly where uh, the onset of the activation was. So we could validate or evaluate the prediction from this uh, location. So in this case, we used uh, 250 simulations by changing the, the onset and also by changing the conduction velocity. So if we look at, uh, at the results of this kind of personalization, so here are the six uh, body surface potential signals on these uh, six points of the torso. So the blue are on the back and the black are on the front. So with a standard electrical uh, simulation, uh, we obtain these green curves, which are not at all the same as the one which were measured. Then once we estimate the onset, with this machine learning approach. So we get these orange curves, which are much closer to the measured potentials on the torso. And once then we estimate the conduction velocity, so what is the global uh, speed in the heart, it improves uh, a bit more the, the fitting. And we can also uh, iterate between these two steps to, to try to improve a bit more. So to evaluate the results, we compared, as I said, to the location of the pacing uh, electrode, so that's this red sphere here. And we could also compare to the cardio inside results. So we used the cardio inside uh, vest of electrodes. And in this commercial system, they also solve the inverse problem in a more classical way. So they propose a epicardial uh, activation map. You can see on the bottom. So by using a model personalization for this and uh, machine learning, means that we have an, an activation in uh, every point of the heart, even inside the muscle. And also that uh, you can see the inside and the outside and also predict and you can also stimulate your personalized model and see if you can predict activation. We could compare the, the accuracy in locating the, the onset, for instance, with this uh, commercial uh, system. But when we looked at uh, different patients, I mean, the the patient number one, so you can see that we have red, we have some onset uh, quite close to the pacing lead, which is on, on the right of the, the wall. But for patient two, for instance, there should be an activation uh, coming from, uh, from the right of the wall, but we have no red at all. I mean, we, don't, uh, we don't estimate uh, any pacing here. And uh, that's probably because there is an infarct here. So, we had a training database. That's the, the problem of learning approach is that, I mean, whatever you put in your training database, you kind of set the scope of what your model is, uh, is able to, to predict. So we had to add um, scars in our database. So we generated infarct and uh, put a of different sizes and different locations. But then it's 5,000 uh, simulations to vary the onset, to vary the scars. I mean, every new, uh, phenomenon you want to introduce in your learning algorithm, uh, you need to generate a larger database and uh, with a curse of dimensionality, I mean, this can explode and uh, not be tractable computationally. So that's why we, we looked at transfer learning and uh, domain adaptation and how to have one way to transfer learning from one heart to another heart. And what we did here is that we have a, a reference geometry. So we use the reference torso 
where we did a lot of simulations with all the scars, all the kind of potential phenomena we wanted to put in the, in the method. And then for new patients, we had some matching uh, process to match the electrodes of this new uh, patient to the electrodes of our reference anatomy and to match the position of the heart of this new patient to the position of the heart in our reference anatomy. So that then we can directly use the, the prediction from our first uh, training on this new patient. Which means that for the training, we can take uh, hours and hours and even days to, to do a lot of simulation. And then for a new patient, it only takes a few minutes to, to register the, the anatomies and project the new patient on the space of the reference anatomy. And this way, for this kind of infarct patient, we could find a very late activation. So all this purple zone here, we could predict it because in the training database, we had cases with infarcts in this location. Well, if we use uh, our previous method, I mean, we would not at all find this late uh, activation and it would just propagate uh, as if the tissue was uh, normal. And then uh, a last way of using uh, modeling for AI is that we don't generate uh, data, I mean, new data. We just add features. So we generate new features so the prediction algorithm has more features to, to do the learning. So this was done in the case of uh, local abnormal ventricular activity. So what is called LAVAS. So it was shown that in a ventricular tachycardia, you can often find uh, around the scar locations with very specific signals I and mean, some sharp uh, high frequency potential. And uh, some studies uh, demonstrated that by burning these locations, you had a much better outcome of the the long-term outcome of, of the intervention. But if you have to go around the whole heart and measure locally every signal and try to look for these sharp uh, high frequency potentials, it's very lengthy. So the idea was, can we try to predict beforehand which locations in this heart will have uh, lavas and which locations will be safe? But beforehand, we have no electrical information. I mean, we just have uh, imaging information. So what we proposed was to augment the imaging information with uh, simulated electrical information. Because we think that the imaging can provide a very nice um, uh, picture of the infarct and how it's located and how it's heterogeneous. So maybe by simulating electrophysiology on this image, I mean, we kind of generate a, a very nonlinear transformation of this image and transform it into electrical signals. And this could uh, be more specific uh, to, to uh, where lavas are. So, so the pipeline was to start from the images. So we used still some uh, image features to predict uh, where lavas are. So we could look at intensity, at texture, and try to predict, given the image, which are the locations where lava could be present. But we also simulated, as I said, a, a personalized propagation. So as we have the image, we have the dense scar, we have the gray zone and the healthy tissue. So we can modify the parameters of the, the model depending on these three areas. And we can simulate with a default formulation, uh, local recordings of a virtual catheter. If we would, moving, we would be moving a catheter in this heart, how would the recordings look like? And we could validate that uh, if we are in a healthy location, so on the left, the blue signals, I mean, the simulated signals we have, so the left colon, are quite similar to the clinical signals. I mean, a very normal uh, potential uh, that, uh, that looks fine. But if we are in locations where uh, lavas were recorded, so these red points, we could see that the simulated signals which were much more fractionated, I mean, very different than uh, the healthy ones, as the, the clinical signals on the right. So here, we, we don't aim at uh, predicting exactly how looks the clinical signal uh, of the lava because it's very complex. What we want is that the features of the signals in these locations are different from the healthy locations so that it helps the learning algorithm. So we extract a set of features on, on these signals with uh, extrema inflection points and fractionation. And we add all these features to the imaging features for the machine learning algorithm. So here we were using a random forest. And one part which uh, I mentioned already is uncertainty quantification. And in this kind of uh, prediction, I mean, you can uh, imagine that as we learn from uh, catheter data, which has been merged to image data, I mean, there's already a 
registration issue. I mean, we are not sure the, it was merged very precisely. And also, it, it's in a beating heart, so the catheter is moving while it is recording. So we actually used the motion of this catheter to and the distance between the catheter and the image to try to estimate the, the confidence we have in, uh, in this data. So we had for each uh, training point a confidence which was a combination of the motion of the catheter and the distance to the image. And we looked at how to introduce this uh, uncertainty in the algorithms because most of machine learning algorithms assume that the training data is perfect. And when you train your algorithms, you trust your training data. So here we had to reformulate the information gain and the criterion we optimize in, in this uh, run of forest so that we could introduce this uncertainty in the training data because some of the training points, we are not completely sure of them. And we, don't, we want the algorithm to rely more on the points which are more sure. So by putting all this together, we could compare the prediction of the lava location. So that's the ground truth map in red on the left with the prediction of uh, this location, just using the images. So that's the blue, just using simulation. So this purple or using both image and simulation features, the orange. And we could show that combining these uh, imaging features with additional simulation features was uh, helping a lot in the sensitivity of the algorithm to predict uh, lavas. So even for given data sets, I mean, we don't have to generate full data sets uh, with biophysical modeling, but we can just simulate some additional features which may help uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. And finally, uh, on the other way, how uh, AI can help uh, biophysics. I mean, first of all, I mean, you probably heard all the all the computer vision uh, successes of deep learning and uh, in medical imaging, it's also very, very efficient. So with uh, Ia Schuderic in Bordeaux, I mean, we, we've been working on uh, music software and uh, databases for many years and labeling them with uh, experts. So that now we can have uh, deep learning tools which are uh, close to the accuracy of uh, expert radiologists. So that's very, very impressive and very fast way to analyze images, to do simulations rather than do manual uh, annotations. But there are still some methodological challenges uh, in these deep learning uh, approaches. So we proposed a new uh, criterion for, for this because uh, people usually use a, a dice index as a error. So that criterion they optimize the dice, which is a measure of the overlap between your predicted segmentation. So the mask of the structure you want to segment and the ground truth. And this overlap measure can be very good with very bad contours because the inside of the, of the structures will have a much larger weight than the contours on this overlap measure. We propose a new contour loss where you add some uh, distance maps actually so that the contours location is really important also in the criterion to help this kind of method uh, provide a good segmentation because we really want the contours to be precisely uh, set in the prediction. And thanks to these very detailed uh, segmentation algorithms, we could uh, segment uh, in accurately uh, CT scan. And actually, in uh, cardiac electrophysiology, you, people usually use MRI to image the infarct because of this uh, enhancement I, I presented where you can have a, a large uh, vision of the infarct uh, thanks to MRI, but you don't see the heterogeneity inside the scar. And actually that's the heterogeneity inside the scar, which is important for the ventricular tachycardia. And so what we showed is that by using very detailed uh, segmentation of the, the CT scan, we can see the heterogeneity of thickness of the wall thickness in the scar. And this heterogeneity of wall thickness uh, correlates very nicely with the circuits of the tachycardia. So we can have really important information on the, on the substrate of the arrhythmia from, uh, from CT scan with detailed uh, analysis, uh, thanks to deep learning. But then we want still to be using model to, to differentiate between all these kind of channels that we see in the scar, I mean, which are the ones which are the most dangerous ones. So here for, for this project, we wanted to have a, an approach which could be used uh, clinically in a very, uh, efficient timeline. So we didn't want to have some meshing problems and uh, all this parameterization and optimization and computation time. And we wanted to go for the simplest possible. That's why we went for the iconal model and we solved it directly on the Cartesian grid of the medical image. So we have no meshing of, uh, of any kind. 
And then we directly uh, parameterize the local uh, connection velocity of the model from cardiac thickness. So basically, if the heart is very thin, that's an infarct, a dense infarct. And if the heart is more than five millimeters thick, then it's healthy tissue and should propagate normally. So we, we built this pipeline trying to automatically uh, segment the image, compute the wall thickness, parameterize the model, and uh, simulate uh, an activation map. And uh, so you can see here in the middle the kind of sigmoid uh, simple function we use between the wall thickness measured in the CT scan and the conduction velocity parameter of the, so the local speed in the iconal model. So we can simulate uh, in a few seconds uh, a cardiac activation uh, on this type of grids. And still, even with this simple model, I mean, uh, we could uh, show in uh, several patients that uh, the prediction of a map for a, a real tree pattern was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite accurate. So you can have the, in the middle, uh, so on the left, that's the catheter data, bottom left, the original catheter data. In the middle is when it's projected on the CT scan geometry. And the bottom right is the model prediction. So here we, we can just simulate one activation map. So it's uh, just to simulate uh, periodic, uh, periodic phenomena. So here in this case, we block the channels and just simulate the propagation, the unidirectional propa propagation to see if we can simulate how would it look like a, a VT circuit uh, in this channel. So the workflow with this music uh, approach is that cardiologists before the interventions can ask the radiology department to send them the images so that they can upload the images on, on the server. And then before the interventions, we can uh, segment the, the images so that we can build a very detailed 3D model they can use to guide the intervention. And also run some simulations so that they can test some uh, interventions on, on the model. So this has been tested, uh, the image segmentation and uh, image guided uh, part has been tested in many different centers on, uh, on more than a thousand patients now. It's been shown uh, that uh, it, uh, it halves actually the number of patients who need a, another intervention. If you use this kind of detailed imaging data when you're doing the interventions, rather than just measuring with the catheter and trying to know where to ablate just from the electrical measurements. And uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, I think one of the challenges for us, for the community of modeling people is to improve this even more with personalized models. I mean, how can we help uh, plan even better uh, the interventions thanks to personalized uh, simulation? And so this is part of the, of the startup in half, which was started with uh, the Yashuviriki in Bordeaux uh, three years ago. Then another way uh, AI can help uh, modeling is in reformulating completely uh, some problems. And uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, ECGI, so I already mentioned this, this electrocardiographic imaging, which is a way to try to predict the activity, electrical activity in the heart from the body surface uh, potentials. And uh, actually, uh, it's, it's in the standard approaches, it's still quite difficult to introduce uh, imaging information. So for instance, I, th I said that thickness uh, was a good indicator of scar and things like that. It's still difficult to introduce the scars and the propagation defects that we know from images in uh, inverse problem formulation. So we propose to reformulate it through uh, deep learning because convolutional neural networks are very efficient in extracting spatial correlation and spatiotemporal correlations and very natural to use with images. And there are some generative models which are very uh, popular these days. So either variational autoencoders or GANs and that's an interesting way to do dimensionality reduction, but also having a probabilistic formulation because you can generate and sample from your latent space uh, several predictions to, to have a, a probabilistic aspect. So what we did is to use this kind of deep learning approach to learn the correlations between uh, the image of the heart, the signals on the torso, and the activation map uh, on the heart in the heart. And then, so we learn uh, a latent space, so a small or reduced uh, space, so here of dimension 16. And then when we sample uh, from this space, we can reconstruct an activation map. But here, this reconstruction is conditioned on the data we have, which is the image of the heart and the signals on the torso. So we could show that on synthetic data, it's uh, working uh, quite nicely. So you can see here, so 
on the left. So A is the ground truth propagation. So you can see that it's not completely homogeneous. I mean, on the right, there is a picture of the infarct. Um, so that's why there is some slowing areas uh, in the propagation. And the prediction uh, of, the, of the neural network is quite interesting, uh, I think quite, uh, quite good. And also it's uh, in the full volume, it's a 3D prediction. I mean, so we have an activation uh, time again in uh, every point of the myocardium. And what is interesting, as I said, that it's a, a probabilistic formulation. So you can sample uh, several times in this latent space and predict different uh, activation maps for the same data. So we computed the standard deviation between 10 predictions. So that's what you see in column C on the bottom. And on D, so the last uh, picture of the bottom is the error map. And what we want to test is whether the standard deviation, so where the predictions are varying the most, it may be correlated to where the error is the largest. So can, can it give us uh, an idea of the uncertainty in our prediction? And in this first test, I mean, it seems that there are more, uh, more variations on the left part of this heart than on the right part. And that's also where the error is the largest. So this is still also preliminary work, but uh, it's an interesting uh, formulation of, uh, of this classical uh, approach. And the last part uh, I'd like to, to present you is the, how can we uh, even try to learn the models? I mean, can we, replace our solvers by uh, neural networks. Because, uh, I mean, if you look at how uh, you, we do a temporal uh, time integration, I mean, similar to what people do in a in residual neural network or recurrent network when you apply the same network again and again on the data. And when we look at spatial derivatives, it's very similar to convolutions. So the framework of, um, of, uh, of a convolutional neural network is quite well suited to, to do a Cartesian uh, so to solve the PDEs on a Cartesian grid. And the advantage is that it's very fast to, to do the prediction with neural networks. So it could uh, solve the equations much faster than uh, classical solvers. And also it's not really dependent on the uh, stability conditions uh, on the time steps, I mean, because depending on the data where it's been trained, I mean, it can learn uh, larger time influence. So potentially you can also simulate with larger time steps than what you're have to use in, a, in solvers. But the question is how long can you forecast because then you, your network doesn't have really the equations. Uh, so maybe it's gonna fail or diverge to other phenomena at some point. But what I think is really interesting in this approach is that, uh, as I said, I mean, one of the limitations is that we are not never really sure of the model equations. I mean, it's always an approximation. And it's sometimes difficult to know how to adapt a, a given model to, to correct for some error. But maybe if we have a kind of uh, intermediate uh, approach, which is a uh, data driven, so with this kind of learning approach, but still uh, integrates the equations, maybe we can try to adapt and to learn the, the, the model error, I mean, correct from data so that we in the end have a, a predictive model, which is in between what were the original equations and what the data says it should be. So to do this, uh, again, I mean, to do convolutions, uh, the best to go back to Cartesian grids. So even for reaction diffusion, uh, we, we forgot meshes and we solve them now on uh, Cartesian grids. And uh, thanks to lattice Boltzmann methods and GPUs, it can actually be done uh, very efficiently. So then we can, so again, with the Mitchell Schaefer model, we can try to learn to train a neural network to, to predict the propagation of the potential uh, using some synthetic data as training. So as I said, uh, the, there is a, something called a residual network. And if you look at residual network, it's something where you add the input of the layers, you add it to the output to force these layers to learn something more than what you already had as an input. And it, it makes it so that it's very similar to, to forward layer integration. It's really the same uh, formula. So that's a quite natural way to, to represent time integration. And by using this, I mean, on this uh, synthetic uh, domain. So here, that's a domain that was not in the training. So we generate uh, randomly some domains with uh, like a non conducting part in the middle. And you can see then the second column is the ground truth propagation. And the third column is a prediction from the neural network, which works uh, quite nicely. 
if you look at the error, but you can saw also that there is some leak, some leakage at the bottom of this car. So I mean, there are still uh, many things to do on these approaches, but I think it's a, it's an interesting way to try to combine uh, these two different methodologies uh, between learning and modeling. So uh, to conclude, I mean, uh, there are, as you know, many challenges uh, in healthcare and often the, due to the data, which is hard to collect and uh, sparse and noisy, which makes uh, learning approaches uh, an even a greater challenge than in other areas. So that's where I think personalized modeling can really help uh, all these AI approaches in many different ways. I think it's also an opportunity to, to rethink and reformulate some of the ways we, we solve uh, problems because we can also try to use a more data-driven way to, to solve these and see how, how then we can combine uh, AI and uh, bioethics. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to interact with you and answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Maxime, for this uh, impressive and exhaustive uh, talk uh, where uh, models and data are uh, truly merged together for clinical application. We can uh, uh, start with uh, discussion and questions from the audience. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand or directly uh, the question uh, opening your microphone as you prefer. Uh, in the meantime, we wait for uh, some question. I would like to ask to, to Maxima uh, first uh, curiosity is about the fact that uh, I saw that uh, you intensively use a equal equation, not, not always, but uh, in, uh, in, in a lot of application, of course, this allowed you to, to, to have uh, almost a real time, uh, let's say, answers. And uh, so, for this kind of application, it is enough uh, to have activation times and thus monodomain or uh, reaction uh, equal equation are uh, for the, such applications not, uh, not needed. This is uh, true or there is uh, some, uh, let's say, aspect for, for, for which monodomain could uh, for some application be, be important. Yeah. I mean, there's of course, yeah, limitations. I mean, the main one uh, is that we can only do some periodic predictions. I mean, we can only predict once. At some point, uh, we did propose a multi-front icon on, I mean, trying to have uh, several fronts. But uh, I think if you want to have some, uh, yeah, some patterns of re-entry, I mean, some several fronts, uh, it's a hack and it's not really uh, precise enough. So you have to go back to reaction diffusion. And, uh, I think uh, Iconol is good for simple propagations or really periodic ones where you just want to go once through your domain. But if you need to simulate for longer time, then yeah, it's, uh, it's too coarse and uh, yeah, it doesn't really take enough things into account. Okay, thanks. There is Simone Stella who raised his hand. So please, Simone. Hey, hi. Thank you for this great talk. I have just a couple of questions. Okay, the first one about the first part of the talk, when you showed results about the patient-specific electromechanical models for prediction in CRT, uh, the question is, did you validate in some sense just stimulated cases or also sinus rhythm cases? So, I mean, we use the sinus rhythm cases to estimate the parameters. So okay. we cannot really validate uh, on this one. But okay. we, we had then several pacing conditions. I mean, I just showed one, but for these two patients, we had like three or four different pacings. So we evaluated the method on different for. Okay, so the sinus rhythm for calibration in some yeah. sense, and okay. And did you separate the mechanical prediction from the electrophysiological one or? In... Yeah, in that, uh, in that uh, work, we did not have any uh, mechanoelectrical feedback. I mean, we, yeah, it was kind of separate. We adjusted the electrical model, then we predicted the activation map, and we plugged it in the mechanical model. And then okay, okay, perfect. And then the final question and about the second part, when you show results about the, the learning part, <laughs> in some, I can say, uh, you show results about the biventricular coarse mesh, because, okay, you used the one, so you need coarse mesh. 
But my question is, if the number of degrees of freedom has some impact on the accuracy of the learning algorithm. So, uh, because I imagine that uh, increasing the number of degrees of freedom, you increase the number of data available, so you increase the accuracy of the learning algorithm. If you try something, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, actually, what is often tricky uh, in 3D uh, learning is the memory you have on your graphics card. And uh, in the end, the resolution we use is often dictated by uh, how much space we have on the uh, the graphics card for the learning because we can only fit one uh, one volume usually uh, okay. given all the layers and uh, everything so yeah that's what we i think the for the inverse problem things uh, the resolution we're looking at is probably a few millimeters or maybe even one one centimeter would be good already to have an idea so i think that's not a, that's not a, a big big issue for learning the the equations um Again, I think uh, the, the convolutions we're going to train them is going to learn the correlation in space and time at the resolution we give them. So if we give them a cursor of final, they should, uh, should learn uh, how it behaves. But then if we, if we subsample too much, then between two steps, uh, the changes may be a bit not natural at this scale. So it may be too uh, difficult for the learning algorithm. But, uh, to be honest, yeah, the resolution in, the, in this kind of the networks is often uh, how much we can fit on the graphics card. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we can pass to a question by Paolo Zunino. Please, Paolo. Hello, Professor Sermesan. Um, thanks for the great talk. I have a question just about one of the last slides that you showed, the one where you showed the in it's the ability of neural network for, to reproduce the, or to solve the electrical propagation of the signal in a, in, in a slab, probably the, the slide just previous this one. So I was impressed by the exquisite reconstruction that you can have through these uh, um, uh, residual networks. My question is about the spatial discretization. Do you also use uh, deep learning for the approximation of the dependence in space? And in case, what is your strategy? Well, we use uh, convolutional networks in, uh, in 3D. So we learn uh, convolutions in, uh, in 3D, which are going to produce this, uh, spatial, uh, this spatial propagation. So the first layer we could uh, potentially, I mean, some people uh, in some works try to initialize actually directly the first layer with something close to a Laplacian. I mean, you could potentially try to initialize uh, your network from what you know of the operators. But then uh, as soon as you start uh, stacking the layers and going at different scales, uh, I mean, it's going to learn something which is uh, still hard to interpret. I mean, you still have to look into it to, to understand what, uh, how it looks, the kind of kernels uh, it, it learned. But yes, the, so the, the convolution in space take care of this uh, spatial uh, propagation. And then the residual part that we iterate is uh, the temporal integration part. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question, Stefano Pagani from Mox2. Please, Stefano. Okay, uh, hello. Um, so, thank you for this great talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the SGI application, and in particular, the one with the offline and the online space. I was uh, wondering how do you manage to deal with the, the passage between, let's say, reference geometry and the patient specific geometry so how, how do you uh, which technique did you use in order to, to deal with it so actually uh, by now it's quite a, a simple approach what we do is that we align the heart of the new patient on the heart of our reference uh, geometry and then we rotate all the electrodes uh, the same way and then we project uh, the electrodes on our reference torso, trying to preserve uh, the angle from the heart. I mean, more or less, I mean, it's going to be the scalar products between, uh, I mean, the, the dipoles on the heart and the electrode position, which is going to guide the, the signal. So more or less, we project uh, these uh, patient-specific electrodes on our reference uh, anatomy to preserve the direction uh, from the heart, I mean, to minimize the angle that we create. So probably the picture in the in the paper, but basically we rotate everything and then we project the, the electrodes uh, 
on our reference parcel. So th this is probably due to the fact that the axis of the heart is uh, the, let's say, the factor which is more uh, affecting the HG morphology. Yeah. Okay. That's Thank you. We want to preserve. Uh, we want to preserve that and then uh, yeah, minimize. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Stefano. Other questions?